Hi everyone, my name is Alex and I'll be chairing today's session. Lee Chantal likely needs no introduction for many of us. As the foundation and power behind Viva La Vegan, an online community dedicated to bringing positive education, information and vegan outreach to a worldwide audience for over a decade, and here today to hold a workshop on ethics beyond the plate, discussing the ways in which veganism and animal activism intersects with other social justice issues, including feminism and environmentalism, to name a few. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming you to Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Love photos, so feel free to take photos throughout. And um, I thought I would just start off with my background, why I'm giving the talk today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about ethics beyond the plate. And um, my background is I went vegetarian 1994 when I was at school, and I was about to consume a, p a piece of the leg of lamb. I knew it was a leg because that's what it was called. I knew it was from a lamb because that's what it was called. And I asked my mum what the particular piece of meat was, and she said it was the Achilles tendon. I looked down at my leg, and I've got one of those as well. And that's when I realised the connection between life that exists and the life that once was. And I stopped eating red meat then. I found out about the dairy and the egg industries a few years afterwards. And I went vegetarian because I didn't want anyone dying for me and, you know, me being the reason animals had to die. And when I found out that the dairy and the egg industries are probably worse than death for a lot of these animals, I went vegan. So next year in January, I'll be vegan for 20 years. And thank you. <laughs> and um, I'll probably write a book about it, so keep tuned. And um, my website, vivalavegan.net, has been going since 2005, the um, end of 2005, when I started promoting recipe calendars just after I'd studied naturopathy, nutrition, and Western herbal medicine. It's been 10 years of information, so it's a good resource for a lot of things. If you need people to learn about specific things, send them over there. I've got heaps of interviews and podcasts, videos, how-to videos, recipes, FAQs, and heaps of talks. So like this talk I'm giving today, I'm going to, I film all the talks that I give and I put them up on my YouTube channel. And yeah, I've been giving talks about the vegan lifestyle for 10 years at all the events. Um, I've written quite a few books as well. Um, this Vegan Athletes book has over 100 vegan athletes from all over the world. That's my latest. And I've got a heap of other e-books as well and I've been featured in other books. And um, if you had said to me 20 years ago, if you'd said to me, hey, I'm a vegan, I would know exactly what that was. I know that you cared about animals. I know that you agreed with the things that I agreed with and we'd get on fine, we'd be, we'd be firm friends. Nowadays, it seems that a lot of the terms and a lot of the vegan stuff is focusing on health and diet. So I wanna just talk about a few things other than food and other than diet today. Now the online search is health and diet. And a lot of, and this is mainstream media, keep in mind. So mainstream media like all this sort of stuff. And they like to focus on terms as well and allergens and things like that. So high carb, low fat, raw vegan, paleo vegan. There's even a thing called vegans. Has anyone heard of that? It's vegans, but they eat eggs, not vegans. <laughs> And so, you know, everyone gets a bit confused nowadays because everyone's focusing on food aspects. And I'd just like to point out that it's focusing mostly on main mainstream media, on middle class, mostly white and thin females. <clears throat> and so, over the past 20 years, there's been many, many changes. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, 20 years ago, it was really exciting if you went to a health food store and you got some dark chocolate. And you know, that was about it really. You had um, soy milk at the um, Coles or Woolworths. You had some brands of, um, of um, biscuits. And there was one brand of ice cream that I can't remember that had a white and a vanilla and a chocolate. That was it. And you really, really had to give up things. 
Like I had to give up ice cream, I had to give up chocolate when I first became vegan. And it was sort of that scarcity mentality. And I still have that, you know, still nowadays I go somewhere and I'm like, oh my God, it's vegan cake. I have to have that vegan cake because I don't know when I'm, I'm going to get vegan cake again. But I get it quite often nowadays. And um, yeah, people knew what a vegan was. And now the term is everywhere. There's so many products, there's so many businesses, shops and restaurants, and it's really easy to go vegan. And I like to say as well, it's really easy to stay vegan, which is the most important thing. And um, whether or not a lot of these places and products are actually vegan or focused on other ethical issues is another story altogether. But there's many different options. So in the past, say, four to five years in particular, people are using the term vegan more. And this is mostly on what you're eating or what you're not eating. And it focuses on things like weight loss and control and fitness. And all these allergens like it's gluten-free, egg-free, dairy-free. <coughs> One of my friends, every time she goes to a non-vegan place, she gets very... Um, unimpressed when she says, oh, what's vegan on the menu? Oh, we don't have anything vegan, but we've got gluten-free. She's like, it's not gluten-free. I want it vegan. So she really carries on a bit about that, but that's understandable because veganism has nothing to do with being gluten-free. And all these food terms that I mentioned before. And so today I just want to go over just a few other terms. You may or may not know about them. And just I'd like you to think about things outside of what you know now. So I'd really like for you to try and always learn about new things and listen to other people. So there's some words here that you may or may not know, and if you're not aware of them or if you don't know what they mean or how it can relate to you, please do a bit of your own research. I've only got about an hour today, so I really can't cover everything, but hopefully we get a bit of a taste. So. Just to reiterate, when people are talking about food and diet, I personally think they shouldn't be using the term vegan, that they should be using the term plant-based because um, these things are not necessarily related to the other ethics that go along with being vegan. And I'm, you know, I'm fully aware that words and meanings change over, over time and that people attach different things to them. But I find it hard when I have more in common with a meat eater who's interested in social justice issues than someone who's vegan just because they want to look, lose weight and look hot in a bikini. So in case you're not aware, this is what a vegan is. So vegans choose to not consume any animal flesh, any animal secretions, any animal products or any animal byproducts. But put it a bit down the bottom, it's not just a diet. And this is what um, the definition of vegan is, and in case you're not aware of it, this is what should be promoted a bit more than it is. And this is from the Vegan Society in the UK, a guy called Donald Watson. So I'll just read it. Veganism is a way of living that seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical, practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, and any other purpose. So, some examples of that would be, these are all the non-dietary aspects. Animals um, not being used for, for clothing, um, products in cosmetics and household goods, animals for testing, and animals for entertainment. So all of these things are the non-dietary areas that vegans agree with and would not want to support. So veganism is a set of ethical guidelines that a lot of people, including myself, commit to. And there's so, so many reasons to go and stay vegan. I went vegan primarily for animal rights, but there's many other issues here as well. So health, fitness, diet, environmental, human labour rights issues, feminism and social justice. And to me, veganism encompasses all the things that I'm passionate about and believe in. So consciousness raising, non-oppression, 
non-objectification and anti-consumerism. Or it can. <laughs> And so, yeah, I went um, primarily vegan for animal rights, but I've also been involved in other movements like feminist movements, environmental movements. And now my focus is more on how all the other social justice issues intersect or relate to veganism. And it's my way of leading by example to promote peace, love and compassion to everyone. And I really like speaking about it to people. So yeah, veganism is great to put your compassion into action, live in line with your beliefs, lead by example, and show others how you want the world to be. And I think one of the best ways um, is to lead by example. And so those reasons I gave before, whether they're mine or other people's reasons, there's so many reasons. And just because something works for you now, or that's your reason to be a vegan now, it may change over time, and I hope it does. I hope you find other reasons to be vegan. So, as I said before, vegans don't partake in all those things I listed. And this includes use, abuse, and exploitation of any non-human animals for any reason. But I want to focus more on things beyond what we do or we do not eat. Who loves puffins? It's a little puffling, how cute. Um, and so to me, being vegan is just one step. And it's awesome and it's important, but it's just one step. So all of us like to go, hey, I'm vegan. Don't need to worry about anything else in the world because I'm awesome, pat yourself on the back. Today, I really want us to be focusing beyond that. And there's so many things that so many groups and organizations do that are really good. I don't 100% agree with any group, to be honest but there's so many things that they can create and that they're doing that you can share and you can get involved with and you can learn from if nothing else. Some examples are like undercover investigations, fact sheets, recipes, some studies people do and more things like that. <coughs> and um, I'd like you to think about doing your own research and working out how to learn more from people, how to do better and how to become a better example of compassion in action. So I just want to talk about intersectionality. And it's a, you know, a word that many people don't understand what it means, but i just like to break it down to the, the main sort of thing. It's just linking things to each other. And it's, to me, it's linking all social justice movements to each other. And some people use intersectionality for just a couple of things. Some use that word for many things as well. So some examples that um, intersectionality addresses include all these ones down the bottom. So like racism, sexism, speciesism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and ageism. Don't have time to go through every single one of those today, but if you don't know what one of those words mean, I really strongly suggest you find out and find out how that relates. So I like to think about um, intersectionality. We're all working together, learning from each other, trying to move forward. Now, um, there's a few things I want to go over, and I'm going to break it down into different sections. And I'm just going to give you a couple of facts or a few different things, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about each of those things. So I want you to think about it. You can yell it out if you like, or maybe just jot it down to have a bit of a think um, afterwards. So um, a vegan diet can be healthy. And I really like to reiterate that nowadays. 20 years ago, you could definitely lose weight going vegan, and it was very healthy. Nowadays, not so healthy, okay? Um, you need to be focusing on the main staples, whole grains, fruits and veggies, nuts and seeds, beans, legumes and pulses. But a lot of people don't eat those things and a lot of people don't really eat those things most of the time. So if you're um, not eating those sort of things, that's probably a not so healthy vegan diet that you're having. And I've also noticed a lot in the past, say, five years, I, I think I blame a lot of things on Instagram, which was around about 2010. Um, there's a lot of people that are using veganism as an excuse to restrict or control their diets, and they're using this as a form of healthy eating when it really isn't a problem. 
And here's just a list of some of the vegan diets that people have. So have you heard of all these, like low carb, low fat, oil free, sugar free, paleo, there's just so many. So here's some questions I really want you to think about going forward, maybe asking other people next time they say about how healthy veganism is. So keeping in mind that there's a lot of fake products and processed vegan products nowadays, should veganism still be promoted as a healthy diet? And should veganism be promoted as a cure-all? A lot of people say, oh, you've got cancer, cure it with veganism. You've got this, you can cure it with veganism. Maybe some of them you can, not all of them. And what can we do to encourage others to be flexible and open to all types of healthful vegan food? So not just being restrictive with the no oil, the sugar free or the gluten free, but just encouraging people to be aware of all the other things that exist. <coughs> and what can we do? Because things like that, when you're being very restrictive, it's not encouraging people long term to stay with the lifestyle. So what can we do to encourage people to commit to the vegan lifestyle long term? And how can we show different types of vegans that exist? So the environmental impacts of um, animal products and animal use, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it, but we'll just go through a few things in case you're not. So um, it's inefficient as a food source. We're, we're feeding animals something like, say, soy, soybeans that we could be eating ourselves and getting the same protein, for example, from that. It's a massive scale. Tens of billions of animals killed each year. Don't know if anyone's been to the States, but I remember the first time I drove past just all the factory farms, it was horrific. It goes on for ages. Um, land clearing and degradation, greenhouse gases, and these include carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And they say um, that the emissions range from 20 to 50 percent, but a lot of those measures are underreported. And um, there's a, a guy, Paul Marnie, um, he does a lot of good stuff for ALV um, in Victoria, and he's written quite a few articles on, on um, environmental impacts on my Viva La Vegan website. And just keep in mind all these things we're talking about, don't contribute to any of these if you're having a vegan diet. But I want you to think about some other things. So where does your food come from? What about the growing, pro producing and packaging processes? I know a lot of people who consume predominantly packaged food that comes from the US. And how far has this travelled? What are the food miles involved with that? Have you thought, thought about food scarcity and food security? One of the issues that comes up every now and then is quinoa and the production of quinoa. They do make it in Tasmania nowadays but that, that is an issue in particular, if you're not aware, maybe have a look. And um, do you support in-season, non-GMO, organic and locally grown produce? It's a bit harder in Australia, a lot of that's way more expensive. In the States, it's only like a dollar or so um, more expensive. There's some things to think about. And you know, humans are animals too. People tend to forget this all the time. And people, you know, I give a lot of talks about um, online etiquette and marketing online. That's like how I make money. But you know, so many people are mean to people online. I don't understand it. And um, you know, I also like to think about and have a bit of empathy for people who are working in avatars and places like that. I don't know one person who after they finish school or even if they haven't gone to school goes, hey, I'm going to be an abattoir worker when I grow up. There's not many people who would say that. And so you have to think about why these people are working in these conditions. Why, why are they doing that? They probably don't have much of a choice. And of course, those things as us being vegans, we're not support, supporting. And I want you to think about some other things like in relation to your vegan clothing, your vegan shoes and your favourite brands. What are the ethics and conditions involved in the manufacturing process? Do you know about these? Do you ask these questions? Do you even care about it? 
How do you know how your favourite products are produced? And do the people who make these items get paid a fair wage? These are things that are really important. And some other things, what about feminism? What about human rights and reproductive rights? So feminists are against the objectification and commodification of their bodies and against their bodies being seen as a product. So what about some groups who um, use one type of female body, say females, um, uh, people, while using and abusing another, say cows? Do you think that's okay? Or the other way around? Um, do you think different types of bodies and people should be used to promote veganism? I think that's really important because a lot of people are not coming into the vegan movement because they're not seeing people who look like themselves in the movement. And domestic violence is such a big issue and I'm sure a lot of you are aware that a lot of people, in particular kids who are harming animals when they're younger, this can lead to them harming people in later <coughs> stages if that's, if that's unchecked. And should we dismiss this certain behaviour just because of someone's age someone's sex, their position in society or their class. These things happen all the time. And I, I want to talk about privilege today because it's very important. A lot of us here you know, have travelled, we're able to afford to pay the money to attend this. We're able to understand, hopefully you're able to understand me when I'm speaking to you today. And most of us have privileges that we never understand and we really don't appreciate them. And you probably won't understand them unless they're taken away from you. And it's really important to be mindful of others. It's really important to exercise compassion. And it's really easy to be judgmental, so try not to be. And, um, and yeah, we always think we have the answers and the solutions to things. We always think we know everything there is to know about it, but we really don't. And you know, it'd be boring if we did as well. You wanna be learning stuff all the time. And this is a quote I like to say quite a lot because it's really important. We all have choices, but some people have much better choices than others. And another thing about that and about people's abilities and whether people are able to do certain things. So if you're putting on events, if you're trying to promote events or restaurants or something like that to people, please keep these things in mind. Can people access the space or the event properly? Can they access transportation to events? Can they afford to attend meetups, restaurants, events? What about, are they comfortable in a space? Are they comfortable around certain people? Can they even get through the day sometimes or get through an event? And can people understand what's being communicated? And I know a lot of people who have had these problems and have had judgment or been ostracised because of these issues in particular. And we need to have a bit more compassion for these people. You know, you can't say to everyone, you know, you need to be able to only go to vegan restaurants. You need to only be able to support these certain things. They might not be able to get them. And here's a few things in particular relating to privilege that I really want you to keep in mind. So when we're saying to someone, we want you to be able to eat this, this and this, some people have no choice of what they can choose to eat or what they can't choose. Some people just want to have something to eat, you know. Um, some people can't afford to buy new vegan clothes or vegan shoes. And um, I spoke about vegan fashion a few years ago. There was this great um, event called Vita Vegan Con in Portland in Oregon. And um, one of the events was, um, one of the panels I was on was vegan fashion. And it was just really interesting to find out everyone's line in the sand, what you would do and what you wouldn't like. Me, I, even if I buy secondhand stuff, which is most of my stuff, um, I would never buy anything that's not vegan. But for a lot of people, they would, and they don't have a problem with that. And then for people that have vegan um, or non-vegan shoes, for example, when I first went vegan, I had a lot of vegan shoes that I just got vegan wares in Melbourne 
to make into vegan versions for me. And yes, that's a bit expensive and not everyone can do that. And I suggest for people, you know, just wear the shoes or whatever you have until, until they can't be worn anymore. Like these ones are on their way out. Um, they're vegan ones. But um, wear them until you can't wear them or buy secondhand shoes. And there's some, there's some cheap versions of clothes and shoes you can buy as well. But then to me, I would prefer something I know is going to last me for quite a few years and that's not supporting, you know, um, something that's made in China or somewhere that I disagree with the way that they use and abuse their workers. Um, some people can't afford to attend vegan events. And there's a lot of there's a lot more vegan events I've noticed that are, have really high price tags, and um, a lot of people don't understand that. And I've put on vegan events myself um, at a few festivals in Brisbane, and it's really hard because you want to be covering costs, you want to make sure that people are getting something good, and you have to sometimes pay people to be there. But you know you want everyone to be able to come to things, and this is the main thing. Want, everything needs to be accessible to all people. And um, a lot of people talk about protests and demos being like the pinnacle of what you, as an activist or a vegan, can do. Now, not everyone's able to do these things. Some people mentally cannot handle to be around that many people. Some people can't even walk out of the house some days. Some people just can't be there physically even and um, that that's not something you should be judging people on because there's so many other things that people can do and by using your own expertise and your passions and your experience in the best way you can that's when you get some good things happening some people really don't feel comfortable amongst um, someone of the other sex some people really don't feel like they belong. Like I mentioned before, if veganism in particular from the mainstream media is white, middle-class, female, how are other people outside of those things going to feel if, they feel if they're accepted or not? And some people don't feel their opinion is valid enough to share it either. So keep these things in mind. Um, and I just wanted to talk about people of colour and black vegans in particular. A lot of people seem to use them as props. And um, when we're discussing something, we're debating things online or we're using them as a marketing tool. And they're not necessarily thinking about how this might feel to them or um, whether or not it, the language that they use or how they're doing the promotion is going to affect them. And we really don't need to use one of these groups, say in particular black vegans or black people in general, to further veganism or animal rights. It shouldn't be, this is good to help this. It should be, this is beneficial to everyone involved. There's some really good books if you want to read about, say, um, uh, slavery and about the Holocaust. Yeah, really good topics. But um, that they're, the way that they're um, written are, is actually really good and it's um, very respectful in the language. So yeah, the dreaded comparison, the top one, and eternal troubling cup over here. And um, Justin Van Cleek from this website called strivingwithsystems.com, that's good to check out if you haven't seen that. Um, has put some tips on a website on how to be a good ally for people in regards to racism and speciesism. And it's just, um, he's just saying we need to employ better sensitivity and discernment in these discussions. Um, we need to be letting people who are marginalised marginalize speak for themselves. You know, I don't know how these people feel if I'm saying something about people being, uh, animals being used as slaves. Why don't we use what they've already said and share the, that sort of information? And um, we need to understand how these things impact and we need to be building a broader community, an inclusive community. And people are saying, why is it racist? There's, I've had a few friends um, just recently called out a few other people or groups online 
and they got very offended because they're like, but I'm doing it for the animals, you're vegan too, why don't you understand, this is like, for the vegans, it's always for the animals. And you have to really think about how someone who's not like you might react or might feel. So I think this is a really good quote that Claire uses, and this is her Twitter um, channel here. And this is an article from an article, Veganism has a serious race problem. And she's saying, material designed to provoke a white audience is also liable to alienate a black audience. We don't want that for one. And by using slavery as a tool to promote vegan values, vegan activists make clear that vegan spaces are frequently racist spaces. So if you're using slavery to promote these values, people are going to say, well, I really don't want to be involved if any, with any of the things that they're involved with, if that's going to happen. And so this is just giving them, it's just showing them there's little room for people of colour. And it results in the perception that veganism is a movement by and for white people, which is the case in mainstream media, but it really isn't. And here's another quote um, from afropunk.com. And these are some good websites to check out. I've got a few others coming out as well if you're, if you're not aware. Um, but um, chattel slavery is really good for people, um, for the vegan community to use. And there's a lot of examples of that. And it's saying um, using black people or showing them as less than human um, is the core of ideologies justifying the system of enslavement originally. And because of this, many black people are triggered and offended by white people's casual use of this imagery. And um, white vegans often argue that our desire to separate ourselves from non-human animals is a speciesist argument. And what they're failing to recognize is that black people are still fighting to be recognized fully as their own species and equally human. I find that really important point there. And what does it mean when these white vegans argue against our demand to be viewed and represented as fully human rather than as props in their version of non-human liberation? And it's just encouraging, it's using this imagery is still encouraging the comparison to happen and justifying oppression. And in America this is a massive problem. And people are still dehumanising these, the black vegans and the black people in general. And white vegans still don't seem to have much of a problem with using the imagery when it suits us, you know? And um, so please read up about these things if you're, not, if you're not aware of them. And there's some websites to check out. I don't know if you want to write them down or take a photo, but they're really amazing. Um, black vegans rock, I think they're all predominantly um, American based but they do have um, some other people from all over the world writing on them. Um, Food Empowerment Project, that's probably my favourite um, group that exists and they do a lot about, um, you know, veganism, environmental resources. Um, I, I actually love what they do. Then there's the Intersectional Vegan on Tumblr. Sister Vegan Project, also very cool. And um, she's got a few books and the Vegan Feminist Network. So these are really important. And please, like I said, you don't, if you're not aware of something, or you, I really encourage you to learn something new. And, um, you know, we really want to be learning all the time. And that's one of my passions in life. I like learning new things and I like, you know, being inspired by people. And I have a lot of non-vegan friends and they can share and help me grow and I can learn a lot from them than just vegan people. And I really think we can learn a lot from these other movements. And an example I like to give is the LGBTQI community. And this is really amazing because they encourage anyone who's an ally or anyone who agrees with their ideas to come and support them or join them. You don't necessarily have to be gay or a lesbian. And um, so if you think about those sort of things, how can we use that idea and how can we relate that to veganism or animal rights? How can we participate in other social justice movements and support their causes? 
How can we encourage others to support our movement, whether or not they're vegan? This is really important because there's a lot of people who really get some of the things that we promote, but they're not going to be vegan. They probably never will be vegan. Um, and you know, is that okay? Sometimes it's not. But how can they support us and how can we use these people? How, we, how can we work together so um, that we're supporting each other or learning from each other's movements? And we need to be promoting veganism in the most inclusive way. This means every single person needs to be able to join us, understand what we're talking about, feel as though they're an important part of the movement. And you know, vegans at best 1-2% of the population. And that really hasn't changed for 20 years, that, that figure. And um, we need to be finding out why, what people care about, why they care about things. That's a good way to plant seeds. And um, hopefully we can um, educate a few people and plant these seeds of compassion in people's heads. But um, we need to be thinking about all those other people, the 98, 99% of people who will never be vegan. How can we get them to join with us? Um, there's a great, there's a few great books by Nick Cooney. I'm not sure if you're aware of him. He started the Humane League in the States. And he's written these great books, How to Be Great at Doing Goods, his latest, Veganomics and Change of Heart was his first. And um, he's, he does a lot of research. And he also has this, um, or he started this, humanelabs.org. So right down that website, if you haven't heard of it, you can join their mailing list and have a look at some of the things. And they do a lot of research, like statistically based real research on why people stay vegan, is this effective, how this works, how this doesn't work. And it's really a wealth of knowledge and I love the stuff that they do. And one of the things I've learned from Nick's books and Humane League Labs is that just because something's important to me, like say animal rights is important to me and the social justice things I've been speaking about, they're important to me. But for most people, they're really not. And that may never change. So they've found that the most effective way to get people to eat less meat, at least, is animal welfare. So if we want to be the most effective in making people become vegan or encouraging people to go vegan, or planting the seeds so people can become vegan. We should be probably focusing on animal, animal welfare issues. And then health reasons is the next one. So like I was saying, all those things that I care about, most people don't care about it. So I have to think about these things and have to think about how I'm using my time in the most effective way and how it can relate to someone and they can resonate with them. And I really want you to think about making some changes. So um, vegans, we don't only care about non-human animals, so we need to start acting like it, because most people don't. We need to learn more about each other and the world around us and keep in mind that someone getting oppressed in whatever movement is similar to the animals getting oppressed that we disagree with. And all of these systems need to be changed. And I understand only 24 hours in a day, so, so much information, so many things to learn. We've got limited time. How can we keep up with Facebook and Google Plus and um, Instagram if we've got all these things to learn? But I really want you to start with the things that resonate with you the most. What do you, all those things I was talking about today, what made you, what made you go, Oh, I really want to find out more about that. Or I really like what I was saying, what she was saying about that. I'd like you to start there and find out some more information about that. And what are you most passionate about? What are you best at communicating? That's probably where you should start. And then always aim to listen and learn more. If, if you've posted something and someone's had it said, hey, I find that offensive because of this, actually listen to them. That's the only way we're going to be able to move forward is to find out why that's a problem, how I can do better next time. And really focus on more good and less harm.
I want to talk about online stuff because it's one of my other passions, but let's be nice and be kind to each other. I don't understand how it's so hard. And you can really disagree with someone or have a debate without being mean to them, calling them names, saying they're stupid or something. I see that quite often. And remember, in particular, people tend to forget this all the time, you may be the only vegan that someone comes in contact with. And what you do and how you do it reflects the whole movement. So you need to start acting like it. And I've, I have spoken to so many people who've said stuff like, I would have gone vegan years ago if it wasn't for that person I spoke to on the corner that was rah, rah, rah. You know, so there's a lot of negative people out there who are really doing the movement a lot of disservice. Here's my top 10 tips for online etiquette. Can you read them at the back? Yep. Okay, so the first one that I like to say to people, and I think this just relates to life in general, is act don't react um, if it's if it's like a big drama and you just want to spill out every obscenity under the sun to someone maybe let's sleep on it write it down maybe write it on paper sleep on it if you're still passionate about it let's think about a better way to put it into words the next day if it's a private matter please keep it private it doesn't need to be all over Facebook I've seen a lot of um, groups and businesses get into massive, massive arguments with people online and it's not appropriate. You need to use correct spelling, grammar and punctuation and really be mindful of what you share, conscious of who will read your posts. What you share online is your branding, it's how you look to everyone else, so be really careful. Be kind, it's not hard. Um, keep your passwords safe and hard to guess. That's a whole other thing about security. But, you know, it's really, really easy for people to work out passwords nowadays or even just for bots and stuff to work it out. If you see someone who's getting bullied by someone online or someone that's being disrespectful, please report it. Whether or not someone's going to do something about it after you report it, another thing. But, you know, please call people out if, if they're not doing what you think is um, being kind. If you ever share something, this is a really important thing in this social media age and all these memes. If someone creates something, it's their creation. They've put time and effort into creating that. The least you can do is say, this image is by this person or thanks to so-and-so for this. Take responsibility for everything you do online. Um, here's a couple of things that I really want you to think about. And I've seen every single one of these things happen online at least once. What language do you use when you're promoting veganism? Is it positive or negative? Is it encouraging or is it discouraging? Is it empathetic or judgmental? Is it preaching or are you teaching? What, what language are you using? Are you using racist language when you talk about other countries and their cultures? Some examples I've seen online are Japan, dolphin and whales, um, dolphins and whales, China and dog meat, and Middle East and live export. Do you use trigger words that might truly upset someone? Words such as slave, rape, concentration camps, don't just throw these words around just because they might not mean something to you, you think they're just a word, it really might upset someone. And really, don't give unsolicited health advice to people, especially if they're terminally ill or they're disabled, because veganism probably might not cure them. A lot of people seem to think it's a cure-all. I really want you to do your own research. Don't just believe it because I've said it. A lot of people seem to do that nowadays, but I want you to investigate and read more about things. I want you to focus on finding out all the things that connect us to each other and not just the things we disagree on, because we're never going to 100% disagree with anyone. Um, for my, my 20 years of being vegan, the um, thing that I would like to encourage people to do the most, my top tip would be lead by example and be consistent. That's it, pretty simple. Lead by example, be consistent, and really be the best version of yourself. 
Um, as you know, we get overwhelmed all, all the time because of all this stuff that we're working on or things that we think people should um, agree with that we do. Um, but you know, people, you can still be educating people, you can still be planting them seeds. And once someone's learned something, they can't unlearn it. It might take them a while to do something about it, but they're still going to have that information. Small steps still get to the same destination. And what works for you might not work for others. We are all made up of the same things, but we're not all the same. It's very important. So here's some other things. I want you to focus on encouragement instead of judgment. Focus on educating and planting seeds instead of preaching and trying to convert people. I see this all the time. People go, I'm going to put on this event, this many people are going to attend, we're going to have this many vegans afterwards. Mm, probably not. So let's really focus on teaching people. Always remember kindness. Always remember compassion. And I want you to be the best vegan you can be. And I want to sort of start from now, please. Um, this is how you can connect with me. Um, here's my Viva La Vegan link. So on all the social media channels, Instagram nowadays too. And here's my Lee Chantel um, channels also. And there's the link to the Vegan Athletes book if you know anyone who's interested in that. And um, I hope you've learned something today. And if you have learned something today, I hope you can share that with someone else and encourage people to learn some things that you've learned today. So I've got a bit of time for a couple of questions, if anyone has any. Maybe, maybe you might wrap it up then. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone for listening and hope you've got something out of it and I hope you learn even more today and tomorrow. Thank you.